friends, and welcome to The World Transform. My name is Phil Bowermaster, and with me in the virtual studio is my co-host, Stephen Gordon. Hello, Stephen. Hey, Phil. How are you? Well, I am super fantastic. And how was your vacation? It was a, it was a great vacation. My family and I are, are more mountain people than beach people, but we went to the beach and we had a great time. You know, some of us went fishing. Uh, my youngest, Andrew, caught a stingray. And wow! <laughs> and how big? Well, it was it was probably a foot and a half across from wingtip oh, okay. to wingtip. The issue became how do we uh, get the hook out of this stingray without uh, without getting getting stung? We got here because that's so, a catch and release thing. I'm guessing you don't really keep that, or do you? Oh no, you you wouldn't. I suppose there's some meat to eat on one of those things, but uh, to me, they're just too cool of animals to oh, to yeah. do that to. You For know? sure, I, yeah. So, uh, yeah, they, they definitely released that. And the shark that they caught right after that. Another one of the people on the boat caught a little little shark. And uh, <laughs> the issue is, okay, let's get the hook out of this without losing a finger, you know. And so, yeah, it, it was an interesting trip. We, we had a great time. Sounds and, like uh, a lot of fun. Well, while you were gone, the, sh- the show went on. We started a new, I started a new podcast series called Adjacent Realities. And that's my, my new solo act. So that's going to be running alongside the world transformed here. So people can, you know, they can enjoy the whole band or they can see, you know, just the, just the solo act. You, you got to start doing a solo act too, you know, Stephen Unplugged or something like that. <laughs> there'll, there'll be people that think, you know, I remember when those guys actually did podcasts together, but it seems like a false memory because they are. Yeah, exactly. So. That's right. Yeah. No, they'll, they'll, the shows will still be up there, at least for now. I seem to recall us doing shows together. Aren't we doing one now? Speaking of which, let's talk about new risks. This is not necessarily looking at the downside. I was thinking about this. Is this one of our negative shows? Is this one of the 20 from the 80-20 on the Pareto diagram? I'm not sure that it is because I think what we're doing here is we're preparing ourselves so that we don't necessarily face these things. Right? We're, we're, we're trying to head off these downsides before they come to us. And it starts with this story here. Could genome sequencing in healthy persons create, and and they have this in quotes, sick patients for life. So follow the link there, and you read about this very interesting speculation about the unintended consequences of genome sequencing, and I guess really of gene therapies in general. And I'll just read this kind of money quote here. It was found that in two of the 11 cases diagnosed as carriers, the doctor had misinterpreted the genetic information. The lead study author, Jason Vassey, says that sequencing healthy individuals will inevitably reveal new findings for that individual, only some of which will have actual health implications. This study provides some reassuring evidence that primary care providers can be trained to manage their patients' sequencing results appropriately. So some, but two out of 11 is you know, not that great of a miss rate now, is it? Uh, that's almost a fifth. <laughs> if what we're talking about is misdiagnoses, you can get that now. You know, I mean, the the risk of a misdiagnosis is with us and is ever present right now. I guess this creates a whole a whole new category in which to make a mistake. I guess right. And, yeah. So uh, in, in a sense, it's not a new risk at all. It's it, here we just have fertile new ground for the same old problem, right? Of having right. Uh, of, of of being diagnosed in incorrectly. So when they talk about sick patients for life, is that not a category we already have? And don't you know people? who are sick their whole lives, right? Who basically right, right. Are go, go from one diagnosis to the other. And, and it could just be that medical science hasn't caught up with what they've got or they hit the wrong thing going in or there's just there's no treatment for, for what people have. I mean, there are all kinds of reasons why people end up suffering with health problems throughout their whole lives. And I guess really when you come down to it, what this is saying is this could amplify that because there are so many things that can be read in the genome. And there are so many opportunities to misinterpret that information. And as you and I were talking before the show started, it also will be a real exciting new opportunity for hypochondriacs, right? I mean, they're, they're... <laughs> right, right. I mean, you can, you can have your whole genome in front of you to find something wrong if you need to have something wrong to, to be happy. So that's uh, right. Whole please. Encyclopedia Britannica worth of data about yourself there to find to find problems in. And that's right. It, and people will find them. I mean, that's the thing. They, they, definitely, they definitely will find them. There will be mistakes made. And it speaks to the fact that when we have new technologies, they bring new risks. It's the law of unintended consequences that we talk about so often. Here, the researcher is hopeful that this isn't going to be a big issue. 
is hopeful that doctors are going to stay on top of this. And in the end, I'm sure we're going to find that genome sequencing, the benefits are going to far outweigh the risks, but the risks will be there. My thinking on this, Bill, is that there's so much information on each individual patient that we would get from genome sequencing that the only way to stay on top of it is to have an AI assigned to it. I do not think that a human, a human doctor could know the ins and outs of even one single patient. One single patient would be a lifetime of work for a human doctor, I think, if you have that much information. And, you know, don't have time to do that. You just can't. So I, I think uh, ultimately you, the the way this gets real and, and, and becomes actually helpful in, in the field of medicine is that you couple this, the couple this huge uh, volume of information with AI that picks through it and finds the real problems, hopefully, and, and some real solutions. Hopefully so. I, 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 would, yeah. I would like to see that be the case. It seems that we are going to need at least an expert system of some kind for each for each genome, because to your point, there's just so much data. Right. There's still a risk. There's the risk that the AIs could be programmed incorrectly or that they could be drawing the wrong conclusions or that they could consistently make a certain kind of mistake, but we will catch all that eventually. It's kind of, it's kind of like the self-driving car thing, where hopefully the systems are talking to each other, and eventually, rather than being replicated and cascading, those mistakes are caught in the early days and the systems would improve over time, such that if there is a big risk of misdiagnosis from genetic information in the beginning, whether from human or electronic doctors, that that goes down precipitously, right? It just continues to decrease over time as we learn more and more and more, and the system becomes more resilient, and we become more resilient as a result. It goes to the fact that when we bring on new technologies, we give ourselves new capabilities, and we expose ourselves to new ways of getting hurt. And my example of this is the threat of EMP attack, right? It's right. predicated on the fact that we live such wonderful lives, that we have a completely modern, electrified, connected world that we live in that in some ways meets all our needs. The electric grid just is the goose that lays the golden egg, right? It's like It is the yeah. thing, yeah. You were saying an EMP attack uh, could take it down, and that, that's a risk to us, but wouldn't have been a risk... A while, a while back, and which reminded me, Phil, of the solar storm of 1859. Uh, it's called the Carrington event. Yep. That um, it was that was a that was a solar storm that was bad enough that it caused fires in telegraph offices uh, across the country. That would have put the entire nation in the dark. That was a bad enough storm. It would have done that. And well, let me uh, tell you it, what that storm did do. It knocked our country right back into the 19th century. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> in the year 1859, you were okay being knocked back into the 19th century. Yeah, it's, it's, in you, year 2018, you were well prepared for that. Yeah, yeah so in the year 2018, not so much. Um, <laughs> you know, the, you could take away all the electrical conveniences in 1859, and most people didn't even notice. I would guess, right, that <laughs> electrical conveniences had been had been removed. Today, obviously, it would be devastating. The, the level of damage, and and that is kind of a perverse way of marking how much progress we've made. It just goes right. to show you how, how incredibly advanced our technological infrastructure is over then, but how vulnerable it is for that very reason. So there you go. What other, what other risks are we facing as, as new technologies? Do you have any good ones? Next yeah. month, the Tesla company is uh, scheduled to do a download to its vehicles to allow fully autonomous uh, transportation in, in Teslas. So there you are. You're driving along one day, and the next day you don't have to drive along if you don't want to. The grind of the daily commute is less grinding. And safer. Yeah, there, there's no point in doing it at all if you can't do it safer than a human can do it already. Right. The hope is from the get-go it'll be safer. And uh, quite frankly, I think it can be. Uh, we, are, we humans are just barely good enough to do this thing called driving. If we were any less capable of doing what it is we do when we drive a car, we just wouldn't accept the risk. Uh, yeah. We would not. We'd still be doing horse-drawn carriages and stuff. So here's my thought, Phil. You know, you're supposed to continue to monitor these systems so you can take over an event that they're confused by the surroundings or something, right? Right. Does it create a situation where you just you're just not available mentally when you need to be available to take over? And you would have been had you been driving the entire time. But now you're absorbed in your cell phone or whatever, and at the moment you need to take over, you are not there. 
I think as long as self-driving systems require humans to step in as like the backup safety feature, that's, that's going to be a problem, right? That's because, a problematic thing, absolutely. Yeah. If it can't do 100% of my driving between myself and my destination, and it needs me for 2%, and we don't know what 2% that is yeah. uh, in advance, then I, you know what? I, I'll I'll take it. I'll do the entire driving. Model. I'd rather drive. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Because it's like a surprise party, a really unpleasant surprise party. <laughs> exactly. Right. Surprise. Yeah. yeah. You know, you need to take over this instant. You know, I, I'm I'm with you. It's got it's got to be a better system than that, and hopefully it will be from the very beginning. But we'll see. When you talk about not not being required to drive, that down the road creates the other possibility, which is if the self driving systems go down. Cars just can't move, right? There's no way to get them from one place to another because they're not designed any longer for people to drive them. You could literally have a car that doesn't have a steering wheel, brake pedal, gas, anything. Right. The engine still works. The tires are okay. Everything's all right. But there's no way to get it any place, right? I mean, yeah. it's, hard for, it's hard for people from our world to imagine. People who live in that world, they'll be used to that. It won't occur to them that that's as big a problem as it just does. It's like, well, just give me a steering wheel and me driving home. I, you know, what's the big deal? I, I, I can live without the convenience just this once. I, so I think there are definitely there are risks with self-driving cars. The other one that I think probably bears further exploration, we won't have time to get into it tonight because we're already just about out of time on this topic, but I, I think virtual reality is going to have some unanticipated risks associated with it. And, and one of them might be that it just makes us really comfortable, like too comfortable with risky situations. For example, I just got an Oculus Go, okay? So I've entered the world of virtual reality. And I haven't done much with it. I've been riding this roller coaster ride a couple times. It actually makes me kind of queasy, so I can't do it too much. But one of the things that happens on this roller coaster, and it's quite fun, but one of the things that happens is it's on a mountain and boulders just start falling down on you. Well, that's fun, huh? you know, and they bounce off and it's no big deal. But you're in what's otherwise you know, you're feeling the motion and it's supposedly replicating the real world. And then it adds this other dimension where in real life, those would kill you, right? I mean, they would knock the roller coaster off the track and, and, and you would be dead. That's a real, that's a real simple example. But I think it's that kind of stuff as, as people get used to having full blown subjective experiences and environments where there are these risks that don't have the consequences that those risks have in the real world. What happens when they face those things in the real world? I'm imagining doing a wingsuit, doing low flying, uh, you know, just right over the, right over the hillside. You've seen the YouTube sure. videos where they're like yeah. 15 feet off the slope, just barreling down the slope. It's insane. But, you know, I suppose if you did it enough in VR to the point that you lost your natural fear of it. I don't know. I don't know. Bill, if it makes it, it would make it better or worse when you face the situation that you've, you've done it so many times that you have the reflexes to survive it, or if you lack the danger cues anymore. You know, I mean, it's uh, you're, uh, that that would keep you from doing it to begin with. I don't know. Which well, is the, worse. The, the thing is, with the VR, you can always switch off the system and then you go to bed, right? It, you know, it's right. Like, oh, I, I messed it up that time, right? In re in real life, you're doing the wingsuit thing, 15 feet off the ground, careening down the mountain, you get. Only the one chance, right? I mean, you, you never, there are no do-overs in the real world. If you have reflexes that are predicated on the idea that, that there's a built-in do-over that you always get another life, I don't know. We don't expect that from real life based on playing video games. But when the video games become a full subjective experience, I wonder if it changes how we, how we respond to the real world. Not consciously. Obviously, people aren't going to think that they get another life. But would there be subconscious feelings and reflexes, impulses that would be... I, I just be don't know. Well, it, you know, it reminds me a little bit of Apollo 13. You, you recall that they had they, they had gone through the test after test, and they kept throwing problems at them until they killed them in the in the simulator, right? Right, uh, right. And, and this is right on the eve of them going out to actually do it for real. And, of course, then they're faced with problems they never even saw in the simulator in Apollo 13. So Right, exactly. At any rate... Uh, yeah. I don't know. Is it better to simulate the uh, simulate the issue as, uh, before you actually face it in the real world? I think, by and large, it probably is better. But I'm not saying is it better to simulate it before you face it in the real world. I'm saying will the simulation, if you spend too much time in it, change how you respond in the real world? Right? I think those are those are different uh, different issues. Yeah, I think pr practicing is a good idea for sure, but. I follow you. I just don't know that I agree. But the point is, if it's not that, it'll be something else with VR. Wait and see. There will be. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> there, there will be another. There will be another set of risks 
that, that that we have to deal with. But you know what? We're out of time. We've already gone long because VR is just so much fun to talk about. But there you have it, okay? New technologies, new capabilities, wonderful new benefits, and risks that we have to be thinking about and planning for. So that's a topic that we will hit again, I'm sure, in the near future. And we're going to be back again Wednesday with a brand new show. Great talking with you, Stephen. Great having you all with us. And until next time, live to see it.